There. Welcome back. It's been a while since we had the green screen up, so I'm excited to um, to do that again. Okay, so um, the plan for today um, is, I think, to finish up this discussion of statistical analysis techniques focused on causal inference. We saw a few examples, and I just sort of briefly want to touch uh, on two additional very powerful and very commonly used examples so that at least you are aware of these. Um, I think you've gotten the message by now that this entire class, uh, just because of its duration, is sort of very limited in the depth that we could go into any specific topic. I do feel like we've covered some topic in, in very reasonable depth, uh, but you know, as, as with everything, there are entire books written about each and every one of these techniques. Um, so you know, and probably we could spend an entire semester talking about any one of the things that we've talked about. Um, so you know, uh, we won't be able to do much more than, than this, but I think this might be a, so a good way to end this section on uh, statistical analysis and, and causal inference. Uh, but before we do this, um, just a couple of things I wanted to um, make sure you're aware of. One, there's no class on Thursday. You know this? Because Thursday is carnival. Cool, What huh? does carnival mean now? <laughs> so historically, it was the thing where they raced buggies down Shenley. No, Plus I understand what it meant in the before times, but what does it mean now in the after times? <laughs> I think, I think now in the after times, it is one of the former spring break days. Oh, it's just a day off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a day off from teaching. We're not teaching on Thursday. Uh, it's, I don't know if people are taking a day off in general, but you're welcome to do whatever you want to do on Thursday. There's not going to be class. Um, you, know, you can do whatever you want. The, um, the other thing I wanted to make you aware of is that we're coming up very fast and very unfortunately, I really enjoyed uh, to doing this class this semester, uh, but we're coming up very fast to the end of the semester. Uh, there's not many weeks left. Uh, you probably know this. Um, if you look at the schedule for the semester on the website, for example, you'll see that we've reserved the last couple of lectures to final presentations of your research projects. Uh, I think we're going to need two lectures for that, just because the, um, the kickoff presentations we had earlier already took more than one class. So uh, the plan is to have the last two lectures be just presentations of your uh, research project results, hopefully. Um, so there's that. So that's two fewer lectures. Um, and um, there's a few other things there on the schedule. Um, I think we have, let's see, not too many left. Let's see, what do we have left? Um, ah, yes, we have four, four more lectures, except for today's and the final presentations. Okay. So now this is a good opportunity uh, for you to tell me if there are specific topics that you feel uh, you would like us to cover um, in more depth or at all uh, that we haven't covered already. I'm, I'm happy to take requests for, for topics. Uh, we have a little bit of flexibility here. So for example, um, I was planning on doing um, entire semester in one lecture style lecture and the uh, last lecture before presentations. For example, giving an overview and a summary of literally everything we've covered uh, over the entire semester to give you like the whole picture of everything we did in, in one class. So I don't know, 75 minutes, like all the material in 75 minutes, whirlwind tour of empirical methods. Um, but you know, we don't have to do that if you want to do something else, if you feel strongly about something else. So, uh, and, and so on. We have a couple of um, more flexible lectures coming up. I'm happy to take requests for other things. So. Um, if you have thoughts or requests, please, you know, just convey those to me either an hour later um, so that um, I have time to put something together. Uh, next time we're going to meet as a class is Tuesday next week. There's no class on Thursday, as mentioned. So I have a little bit of time to put something together if you want something else, something than, um, than what I had in mind. Uh, what I was planning on doing with the rest of the semesters, the four lectures left, is 
to dedicate one to mixed methods designs. We saw a few of them in passing, but we really didn't really reflect on sort of how and, and why to combine methods and how to report and execute mixed method designs. We didn't really do that very deeply. So I, I feel like we could, we could reflect a little bit more on that. So I was planning on, on spending a class reflecting on mixed methods. So that leaves three, except, um, except that one. Um, yeah, I was planning on using one to talk about um, the ways to step up your science communication game. Uh, think of ways to um, produce prettier papers. So I was planning on going over sort of data visualization and scientific visualization best practices and, and worst practices, kind of following the top the design rules and things like that. Uh, and then talking about some just uh, general science communication and presentation best practices. Um, so that's one. Um, um, and then I was thinking that we could talk about uh, a few interesting meta topics. So one, I was thinking it might be interesting to discuss some very controversial, very dramatic research papers that have happened recently and sort of discuss and reflect on the con controversy that has surrounded those papers in the community. Um, I have some really cool examples of uh, people accusing each other of, of terrible things, uh, authors accusing each other of terrible things. So, um, you know, we, I could send out some examples and we could, we could spend the class. Um, there we would have everybody read these things in advance. So we can't have just somebody, uh, one person read and present to the whole class. We, we sort of have to really uh, get familiar with the material uh, really well. We have to really have read those papers that are being criticized and whatnot uh, carefully so that we can have an opinion about, um, about the criticisms. Uh, so that's, that's one thing that I was planning on doing. Uh, and then there's a little bit, little bit of flexibility. We could, uh, we could talk about sort of the big, uh, big data and some of the challenges with doing analyses of big data. We could talk about uh, ethical issues. We could talk about other things. Um, so, you know, just let me know if um, you'd like something other than the things I mentioned uh, and we could, uh, we could fit that in in the remaining time, okay? Uh, okay, um, something else still. I'm um, a little uh, not worried. I'm not worried. I'm a little uninformed about your final research projects. So I thought, especially since we don't have class on Thursday, that instead um, we could find some time to meet individually, uh, you and me, for, I don't know, 10 minutes um, between uh, now and the end of the week or so, uh, for example just so that I am aware of kind of how your projects are going, what challenges you're facing, things like this. Um, maybe I can offer any, any advice on how to um, you know, finalize your projects or your reports or things like that. Um, so do you think that'd be worth doing? Just checking in about the research projects? I see some positive nods for some people. So let's do that. Let's follow up with that uh, offline. Let's find, I don't know, 10 minutes each, um, 10 minutes with each of you to catch up about this between uh, now and the end of the uh, end of the week, if we can, so that we're not too, uh, so that I'm not too surprised when the final reports come in and you're not too surprised when the final reports and grades come in. Does that make sense? Uh, and yes, I know I still owe you grades on the, uh, statistical analysis homework at the very least, um, possibly other things too. Uh, I know I'm, I'm working on that uh, in between um, not sleeping and everything else, but yeah, I, I know I'm aware. I haven't forgotten. I promise I'll do it as soon as I physically can. It's not, I, I, I'm not trying to be deliberately slow. Uh, okay, so that said, let's talk about some interesting stuff. So, Let's start with the diff and diff, which is very popular. It's like one, one thing, let's see, has anybody um, read the Florida example and the slide deck from last week? That was the one thing we didn't get to cover. At, uh, it was part of the slide deck, but we didn't get to cover it in class. 
if you are familiar with this and you've read that, you can make a sound or something. It's okay if you haven't. I'm just, um, there was a point in there that is important. So I'll, I'll bring that back. Okay. So um, the point, the point that's important is the following. So you know how um, we, we, we got very excited about, for example, this interrupted time series analysis method um, because it had these ingredients or uh, came close to having these ingredients that are important to make causal uh, claims, to establish causal relationships. Does anybody remember what the three ingredients are to establish a causal relationship? Nope, no one ever does. <laughs> they have to, uh, one has to come before the other. Uh -huh. They have to be correlated. Uh -huh. And I'm trying to remember precisely what the last one is, but it's, it's vaguely um, nothing else should have caused the effect that's observed, mm -hmm. or you should be able to eliminate other things that caused the effect. Yep, yeah, so the specific language is not too important there. Um, th that's the, uh, the gist of it, is that you have to exclude plausible alternative explanations. Um, that, no, you have to exclude other possible causes of the same effect. Okay, and this, this one, this last one, is the one that's the trickiest. Okay, because you know the, the temporal precedence thing is relatively easy, um, just because of the way time flows um, and the, the, you know the way we can set up measurements and so on. The correlation thing is relatively easy because we have all kinds of statistical analysis machinery to establish correlations. Um, so you know those two are relatively straightforward. The one that's always the trickiest is the one with excluding other things that could be causes. Right, so you know, uh, is CJ around? Let me see. I I only see a subset of um, yeah, CJ is there uh, of the um, the room. Remember, uh, I think last time I was talking about this um, um, interrupted time series analysis method, and so I think CJ, you uh, were asking if you know what if there's something else that happened at the same time as that intervention you're studying. Right, like what is there? What if there is this alternative, plausible alternative explanation, a, a different cause for whatever effect you're observing? Uh, and I think we were talking about the study on badges, and you were asking something about some, um, I don't know, a GitHub promotion that happened uh, concurrently or, or something uh, uh, with the introduction of those badges or something like this. Um, so that was a good. That was a good question, right? So this is always the hardest thing. The hardest thing in, in any of these is. Um, establishing the lack of plausible alternative explanations, right? Um, so, like, think, go back to the um, um, like randomized experiments discussion we've uh, we've had for a long time. Okay, like, what is the um, the key idea there that allows one to exclude plausible alternative explanations? Uh, for each random event, there would have to be, I guess, the same thing that occurred across all these random effects or random events to also be a potential cause. And that's very unlikely to be the case. Right. But where does uh, randomization come in? Um, for the badges was, if I remember. It, like for exper randomized experiments in general, before badges, oh. like, like true experiments, the ones in a lab or whatever. Where did randomization come in when we talked about just true experiments? It was when you sorted individuals into different, um, I guess, the test and the control. Uh -huh. or... There it is. Okay. So the key idea with experiments was that you divide up your study participants into, say, two groups. Or let me rephrase. The key idea is, is that there is a control group, okay, that did not uh, receive the treatment, 
that did not experience the intervention. That's the key idea, the existence of a control group. So that if you're detecting some effect in the people that were treated, right? It's because of the existence and presence of this control group without an effect, presumably, that you can conclude that the effect uh, is, is real, right? So that's really important. And you know the, the random assignment uh, mechanism there ensures es essentially that um, plausible alternative explanations get automatically excluded because through random assignment, they should affect both of the groups equally uh, on average. Uh, so that, that was sort of the, um, so how uh, randomization played into that, uh, into that design. Right, so, so now we can't do experiments for any number of reasons. Um, maybe it's unethical, maybe it's really expensive, maybe we just are studying something that has happened in the past so we can't go back and experiment with it. Uh, we, all we have access to is uh, observational data. A, a large number of reasons that, uh, that why we can't do experiments. So, right, so the key idea, right, the key challenge, not idea, the key challenge with all of these causal inference observational studies is to try to approximate those true experimental conditions as best you can right that's that's all that that's all everything we've talked about and in, in all of this was it's like you know how do we try to mimic how do we try to recreate uh from observational data that we can't intervene with and we can't do random assignment and so on we can't manipulate directly but how can we recreate so those experimental conditions as, as best we can, so that we are as confident as we can in these uh, causal claims that we're hoping to make, okay? So this is where this um, uh, key idea, the key idea for the true experiments was this comparison between treatment and control group, right? Uh, and so that key idea carries over to a lot of these observational studies, okay? Um, if, Let's see, in, yeah, last, last week when we talked about um, the interrupted time series analysis technique uh, and we read the badges paper, um, I tried to argue that, so the, the same key idea, this existence of a control group was something that we incorporated in that design to some extent by um, having uh, these different projects all experience the treatment at different times. Um, and so therefore by aligning these observations on the intervention date, we could sort of uh, control for some of these confounding factors that way, right? Um, because they didn't all experience the intervention at the same time. And so I, I won't revisit that now. But so here's another way um, to, um, you know, instead of doing that, Kind of implicitly, um, there's also a way to do that explicitly, to uh, explicitly consider a control group and analyze uh, the effect in, in that as well and compare the effect in your treatment group to that in the control group. So um, we'll see two examples of that today. This so diff and diff example and the causal impact example, both of these try to do that. The diff and diff is a really old thing. It's been around forever. Um, people have used it in uh, econometrics and the social sciences and whatever for the longest time. It's a very popular thing. Uh, conceptually, very easy, uh, very simple to understand, I think, um, and also very powerful. So um, the idea is that we're working with this observational data. So we don't, we don't really have random assignment, but we somehow are able to construct an appropriate control group, right? So um, here, you know, with the diff and diff, we um, um, have some inter intervention that we're looking to, uh, to evaluate. Um, and we have observations of whatever outcome variables we care about both before as well as after this intervention. And you see that represented here in this figure behind me. And so we've measured some outcome in both the control and the treatment groups before and after this intervention. 
Okay. Um, and oops, there is no clicker. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so now, right? How do we reason about effects? Um, we have to construct the counterfactual, right? We, we talked about this many times before. Um, we have to identify to find a counterfactual. So what would the counterfactual be in this case? The counterfactual here, right, is, um, so on the one hand, right, we have um, in each of these groups, in the treatment group or in the control group, we can measure the difference post-intervention compared to pre. We can see how much this outcome variable that we care about changed after the intervention compared to before, right? We could do that in both of these groups independently. So now, um, what if we uh, estimate the difference of these two differences, okay? I'm claiming that that is the actual estimate of the uh, treatment itself, void of other confounds. Okay, so here's the idea. The idea is that, um, so let's look at this example and the figure behind me. The idea is that um, there might be plausible alternative explanations for this effect, for this change in whatever outcome variable you see there, right? And if you look only at the control group, you do in fact see that, right? You see that the people uh, in the control group got better at whatever this measure is after they've been treated. Sorry, um, they have not been treated. Um, after the, um, um, after this intervention, meaning, um, so, so at the same time as after this intervention, meaning that um, th this plausible alternative explanation or sets of plausible alternative explanations are what is causing this, in, this change here and the outcome variable, right? So these are the people that have not been treated but have otherwise been exposed to the same environmental changes or policy changes or weather changes or whatever else, right? That could explain this. Um, okay, um, and in contrast, the people in the treatment group have, in addition to all of these environmental changes, also been exposed to the treatment itself. Okay, so by subtracting these two differences in the value of that outcome variable between uh, the treatment group on the one hand and the control group on the other hand, we can get an estimate of the true effect of the treatment as the claim here, okay? Because if it hadn't been for the treatment in the, in the treatment group, in the blue group there, the outcome measure should have followed the same trend as in the control group. You see that? Okay, so you know it's it's okay if they're different to begin with, right? That's that's not really the point. They don't have to start from the same uh, from the same value. But what's important is that the trend would have been parallel. That's the assumption. That's the key assumption behind this entire method, right? The assumption is that the trend would have been parallel had it not been for the treatment. And, and whatever outcome measure this is, right? Um, and it could have gone up or down or whatever um, for any number of other reasons but the treatment. But the point is comparing the treated group with a control group appropriately selected, right? The, true, the two trends should uh, be parallel. But that means the control group is appropriately selected. If the two trends would have been parallel otherwise, that's an appropriate control group, right? It doesn't matter what it is. It just matters that they be parallel, okay? And now the difference in differences, that's where the name of this thing comes from, is, uh, hopefully you can see that, 
uh, an estimate of the true effect here. Because we've excluded whatever happened for any number of other reasons to people in the control group already. Okay. So. Oh, I had a question. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm just wondering, would it, so we're, we're doing differences on differences, but I'm wondering, would it sometimes make more sense to use a ratio instead? Um, if your values are large, and difference in comparison to each other. So like if one was like a difference from five to 10 might be a big difference, whether a hundred to 105 may not be as much of a big difference. Um, so I'm wondering if this diff and diff, does that account for, I guess, ratio, like these differences in sizes essentially. Um, it's, so I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I think um, if I understand correctly, I think um, what you're asking is orthogonal to the design itself. Um, so I think you're asking a question about, for example, if you remember this discussion of standardized coefficients and z-scores and scaling and so on that we did a while ago. Um, so changing the, the scale and the unit, and we, on which you're reasoning about these coefficients. Um, that's something that's sort of orthogonal to so how you set up the comparison, um, right? So like how, how and what you measure, what scale you measure things on and whatnot, that seems orthogonal to how you set up the comparison. The key idea here is just to set up this comparison between a treatment group and a control group both of which are observed before and after this intervention. So there's so four observations um, here um, before and after this intervention. The control group didn't get the same treatment, right? But you can measure them, you can observe them at the same time as the people that have gotten the treatment, both before and after. So I think that's the key. The key here is the design, is so setting up the comparison in this way. Uh, and then the, um, the variable itself that you're using as an outcome, that's sort of, you know, you, you could set that up in, in any way makes sense to, uh, to what you're trying to do with this. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's sort of what I'm interpreting as, as your question. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's similar. Um, so maybe, maybe okay. So let, let me see. Um, now that I think about it some more, the diff in diff does not allow you to reason about slopes, about trends. Okay, so we're, we haven't reasoned about that at all. Um, what we're able to do with this is reason about um, mean changes in this outcome variable before and after but not about slopes. I think your, your question about ratios is a question of slope. And that's not something that the design by itself allows. It's something that you would have to do separately by uh, interpreting these uh, effect sizes relative to something. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, but that makes sense. Maybe that's a better answer than the first one. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so we, we talked about that. You've seen the, this example. Oh, yeah, okay. So here's a, um, a way to implement this. Uh, and I think this should not come as a surprise to you anymore after the different examples of regressions we've seen, linear regressions we've seen. Um, so this is an example data set illustrating um, that effect on the previous slide. Uh, there are a number of subjects you see those in the first column. Every row is the set of observations, measurements for these subjects. Notice how every subject is observed twice, okay? Once before and once after the intervention. And you see that post variable there, uh, just a Boolean flag reflecting that, reflecting if, if that observation is before or after the treatment, the intervention. Okay, that's just the Boolean flag. Um, then 
you see, so that, that's one important flag to set up this Boolean that tells you if the observation is before or after the intervention. The other important thing to set up is another Boolean flag that tells you if this subject is part of the treated group or the control group. So notice there in the example how the first couple of subjects are part of the treatment group and the bottom two subjects are part of the control group. And obviously, um, so are all of their observations. Okay. Um, and then you see some measurement of this outcome variable. Um, that's the outcome column there, uh, second column. Um, and finally, <clears throat> the trick to model this with um, simple linear regression or multiple linear regression rather um, is to include this interaction effect between treatment and this post variable. So I remember us discussing last lecture when we talked about the interrupted time series. Um, I remember asking you how you might be able to model the same thing um, with only two variables instead of three. And I remember us converging on the solution that involved an interaction term between the two variable, the time counter and the treatment flag, right? And so not needing this third one. So this is sort of a very similar idea, but we don't have any slopes here. We, we don't have any trends. We don't have slopes. So we don't reason about slopes. We reason only about before versus after and treatment versus control, right? So that's why it's sufficient to implement this, it's sufficient to just have these two Boolean flags that you see there, treatment and post. You can call them anything, of course, okay? Um, so the, the regression equation is the one you see there on top. It's just the, um, the two terms and their interaction, okay? So now here's what happens, it's very interesting. So I've done this, um, I have, taken this artificial data set that um, you've seen illustrated um, and I have built this model in R just before class. Um, why as a function of the treatment flag, the post flag and their interaction. Okay. And this is the R output for this artificial data set. And by the way, uh, I should have mentioned that earlier. The values that you see um, inside the circles there on the, on the chart on the right hand side, those are the mean values for the outcome variable um, in, in each of the two groups and before and after the intervention. Okay, so let's interpret this model together. Okay, so let, let's start. Um, Let's start with the obvious, uh, maybe obvious thing, uh, the intercept estimate. Okay. So the intercept estimate there is 35. Notice the uh, scientific notation, right? So 3.5 times um, uh, 10. Okay, so 35, the intercept estimate, 35. So notice how that is exactly the mean value and the control group before the intervention. Okay, so what? Why is that? Can we can we reason about that? I mean, the only two variables in the model are treatment and intervention or post-intervention and with no treatment and no intervention this is the number that you get because they're both set to zero right because of how i've encoded right. them right so i've encoded them as boolean flags they are zero or one um, and when they're both zero it means i'm pre-intervention right so the post is zero i'm pre uh, and i am uh, Control, not treatment, 
right? So of that combination of things, right? Where, where am I? Am I pre or post? And what am I? Am I control or treatment? That only leaves me with this bottom left point there. Okay, so this is the estimate of the mean value of this outcome variable in the control group before the intervention. Cool. Okay, so let's look at the next one. Next one, the next coefficient for treatment, that's the beta one coefficient there, um, left to right. The coefficient for treatment, 15 is the estimate. Okay, so what has changed? I'm still, the, the pre variable is still set to zero, right? So I'm pre intervention. But this is the effect of going from um, treatment equals zero, meaning control, to treatment equals one, meaning treatment. Okay, so going from the red control group to the blue treatment group is an estimated, est estimated 15 units increase in the outcome measured there. Okay, and this should not be surprising because I've artificially created this data set to do exactly this. I'm, what I'm trying to show you is that I can recover these things that are inherently part of the data set, right? Uh, um, to show you how to interpret these coefficients. So the coefficient for treatment in this case is the difference in outcome, mean difference in outcome before the intervention between the control and treatment group. Cool. Um, next one up is the coefficient for uh, pre. Okay. So here, going from pre-intervention to post-intervention in the control group, okay, I assume everything else is fixed. And as it turns out, treatment is fixed to zero. So I'm in the control group. That's how the, that's what the reference value is there, the baseline, treatment equals zero by default, right? Um, going from pre-intervention to post-intervention in the control group gets me 20 more units of whatever that thing is. Okay, and you know, that's exactly what I started from. So um, I'm showing you that I can recover this. And now, right, the, the thing we've all been waiting for is the actual estimate of the treatment itself, except for all the void of all the confounds. Okay, so that as so happens is the exact estimate of this interaction term. Okay, so the um, interaction term estimate there is 15 units of whatever this thing is. And that is exactly the uh, estimate of the effect. Okay, so how do we reason about this? What would have happened? So what would have happened is if uh, the treatment, the intervention didn't have any effect, you would have expected the same slope there, right? You would have expected that um, this outcome measure be 15 units greater post-intervention um, compared to the control group, like it was before the intervention, just maintaining the slope, okay? Um, and whatever's left, if anything, between those two, the difference of these differences is the true estimate of the effect there. Uh, and that happens to be 15 units. Okay, so um, like back to the, um, I guess, bigger point about this, um, you can hopefully see that it's um, quite straightforward to set this up uh, and model and estimate uh, these coefficients and therefore the size of these effects, the, the size of these true effects, right? Um, removing these plausible alternative explanations. Uh, it's quite easy to do that um, if you're able to put together an appropriate control group. 
Okay, so I've, I've sort of, I've shifted the problem, right? I still haven't solved the original problem of, you know, how do you find the appropriate control group in the first place? Like, how do you exclude these plausible? I, I've sort of changed the problem a little bit. Uh, we started from, well, you know, it's really hard to exclude plausible alternative explanations to, well, it's really easy to exclude plausible alternative explanations with a, for example, diff and diff design, um, as long as you can find an appropriate control group, but it's actually, you know, just as hard to find an appropriate control group. So I've sort of, I've, I've changed the problem, but I haven't really made it easier um, in that way. But at least, you know, at, at least um, to the extent to which you're able to identify these uh, control group individuals or whatever, um, and observe them at the same time, that is a really powerful thing um, that lets you um, make much stronger causal claims, right, than you would have otherwise without such a control group. So if you think about the interrupted time series thing from last lecture, the badges example, um, another way of describing that design there, the particular example with uh, aligning on the intervention date across many packages is to say that every other package is a control group package for the one, right? So all the, all the packages that did not experience the intervention at the same time are basically controls for the ones that have experienced the intervention. That was sort of the, the, the way to think about the control group there, okay? Uh, and we were fortunate because the data sort of naturally allowed that kind of um, uh, reasoning, but you, know, you don't always have the luxury of doing that. You don't always have uh, that naturally be part of the data, right? So it's, it's actually hard to find an appropriate control group, but if you have one, it becomes relatively easy to use it to model and make causal claims. Okay. Any, any thoughts on this before I move on to uh, something else? Maybe to follow up on my previous question. Um, so we can we know there's like a difference between the counterfactual and the compare or the treatment group, but um, how do we know if it's statistically significant that there's a difference? Oh, um, that's an that's an easy one. So the the magnitude of the difference between the treatment group and the counterfactual is, as it turns out, the estimate of this interaction term and the regression model that I showed you on the left hand side. Right, so that uh, 15 value there is the estimate of that difference. In this case, is the actual difference. It's sort of not just an estimate, but the true difference, because this is an artificial data set. Uh, real data sets won't be this clean and, and nice to work with. Um, and uh, just like with any regression that we talked about before, um, you also interpret the... Um, um, statistical significance level, the p-value associated with these coefficient estimates. That's the thing you see there on the right-hand side, the column pr greater than t and those little stars that follow it. Okay. That tells you if this coefficient that you've just estimated, uh, 15 for the interaction term specifically, is that coefficient statistically significantly different from zero, yes or no? Or rather, you know, uh, with high probability, okay? It's, it's likely that um, you're confident that it's statistically significantly different from zero, but that's what a p-value tells you. Otherwise you're not. If, if you get insignificant p-values there, so insignificant coefficients, then that tells you that there may not be an effect, right? So you always read them together with their uh, associated p-values and statistical significance levels, right? So in this case, right, because um, you can read that in the p-values there, the p-values are very, very small, uh, two to the uh, 
uh, minus 16 is um, uh, the lowest R reports. So it's that's just an, uh, it basically says it's zero, uh, right? That's the way to read this. So that, that's how you do this, right? You interpret the coefficient estimate if it's statistically significant, right? Otherwise you can't really trust it. Sounds good, thanks. Anything else on this? Then let me show you um, a quick other one. This is very, very cool. Um, I um, learned about this recently through uh, a software engineering paper that was published at ICSI, the Software Engineering Conference, um, two years ago now, I think 2019 or something. That was the first time I've seen this uh, technique be used in software engineering. Um, and it uh, turns out it's quite clever, uh, A, and B, very easy to use. So this is something that uh, folks at Google have developed. Uh, it's all uh, open source and you can find it online and there's an R package and so on. Um, actually, um, this talk that I link here on the bottom is uh, from a few years ago by one of the main authors of this technique. Um, I would like to ask you to carefully uh, watch and, and so sort of reflect on this talk, not just in terms of the, the content itself, which I will briefly uh, cover next, or some of the content I'll briefly cover next, but in terms of how this talk is designed, structured, and presented. Um, I um, mentioned in the beginning that I'm hoping we uh, get to spend some time in a week or two and uh, reflecting on good ways and bad ways to communicate science and present research in particular. Um, and this example of, uh, of, of a research talk, if you will, of a technical talk, is one of the best I've ever seen ever. So it's really, really good. There's only, there's only one thing that, um, that I could possibly think of to make that talk better. It's, it's virtually perfect in every way. Um, so I want you to look at this, to watch the video. It's a short, relatively short video. I think it's about 30 minutes on YouTube. I want you to watch this video. And when we come back to talk about presentations and other things uh, in a week or two, I'm gonna bring this back and reflect on this a little bit um, to sort of argue why I think this is so good. Okay, but you know, please watch this. Um, okay, so this thing uh, came out as a so criticism to the diff and diff, which we just saw and talked about uh, before. So the, um, the one piece of criticism um, for the diff and diff is that um, it, because it relies on this uh, a static linear regression model um, that, that we've seen many examples of before. That means that it suffers from some of the same limitations that we kept uh, mentioning in previous lectures as well. Uh, for example, the non-independence assumption between these observations, right? So um, that's sort of, uh, very clearly fundamentally violated in this diff and diff design because the, um, uh, the two observations uh, pre and post intervention belong to the same individuals, the same subjects, right? So those things you're regressing over are um, sort of fundamentally non-independent, which is sort of one of these um, assumptions behind uh, traditional regression. So that's a one, one criticism. Um, another one is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't account for slopes at all. It doesn't reason about trends over time and, and so on. It only considers these two time points, pre and post intervention, you know, whenever those might be, but just two, just two time points, 
But it's like, what if you get really lucky or, or really unlucky and you happen to observe this at just the right or wrong time, right? The sort of a, um, it doesn't put yourself in the best position to capture something, uh, right? If, you're, if you only get these two chances to observe something, it's, it becomes harder to observe the thing you're hoping to observe, right? In, if instead you had more time, you had access to the entire history and so on, you could reason more about how something evolves over time, um, its onset, its decay structure, and so on, right? So um, diff and diff, really powerful, right? Because of this pr presence of a control group and because it allows you to essentially exclude plausible alternative explanations, but also limited because it only considers these two time points, for example, okay? So now th what these people have done is they've tried to sort of remove those limitations um, by um, essentially looking at uh, a time series instead of just sort of individual observations. Um, and this is a very, it's a very clever thing. So let me show you an example. Um, so here's the same um, counterfactual reasoning that we need to do any of this. So this was an example of how um, back in 2015, uh, the uh, Swiss central bank um, stopped pegging the Swiss franc to the Euro at some point. So before, before whatever date that was, mid-June, June 15 or something, um, the Swiss franc had always been tied to the Euro. So the exchange rate was by construction fixed. Okay, that's was what the, the Swiss central bank had, had done historically. And after that, they just let the Swiss franc float uh, and be subject to you know, uh, the market forces and whatnot. Okay, so you, this is a very clean example um, of um, counterfactual reasoning here because um, it's quite clear what the counterfactual estimate would have been had the intervention not be present, right? So looking at so how that uh, time series evolved before the intervention, we can be very confident of how it would have evolved after the intervention had there not been an intervention, right? It would have continued to be uh, flat, right? Because the exchange rate was sort of fixed by construction. So given such a super clean counterfactual estimate, it becomes very easy, very nice to um, estimate the size of this causal effect of uh, introducing this new policy because we have such a great estimate of the counterfactual, right? It's, so the effect, the true effect, the causal effect is the difference between the two. It's, you know, whatever um, the exchange rate ended up being minus the, the counterfactual or the other way around, right? So this is all nice, but it's, you know, things in, in nature and reality are never this nice. So they talk about how the real time series of, of uh, all kinds of other phenomena, observations of measurements of all kinds of other things uh, are never that nice. They're always much more noisy and subject to uh, seasonal trends and yearly trends and weekly trends and all kinds of things. Um, and they're just never, never that nice. But um, the key idea is the same though. The counterfactual here is a forecast of what that time series would have looked like had it not been for the intervention. Right? So it's, if you're able to somehow do this, you can apply the same counterfactual reasoning to say that the estimate of the causal effect is the difference, therefore, between the two, between whatever you observed and this time series after the intervention and whatever you estimated the counterfactual to, to have been, right? So the reasoning stays the same. It's just um, the question becomes, you know, how do you estimate this counterfactual? Um, and here's where they have this really clever idea. They're saying, um, what if... 
So again, it's the same clever idea that we started with with the diff and diff. What if we have some good control groups that we could use for comparison? What if we can identify those uh, and based on A, the history of this time series that I'm interested in before the intervention, the black line there, and B, um, the histories of these time series in the control group before and after the intervention. Given these two things, what if I can just forecast what my black line there, my time series of interest would have looked like had it not been for the intervention? Okay. Um, and there's, a, you know, we could think of doing this in any number of ways. The um, specific modeling technology that you use to implement this forecasting doesn't really matter that much. They're using something Bayesian to do this uh, that I'm not super familiar with, but the specific model they use to, to do this forecasting is not, is not the important part here. The important part here is the sort of conceptual uh, uh, design of this, okay? So the idea is like before, the idea is that you know, had it not been for this treatment, the intervention, my time series would have evolved in a similar way as the red and green ones ended up evolving. That makes sense? And you select the red and green ones um, in um, such a way that they are um, either absolutely unaffected by your intervention or extremely unlikely to be affected by your intervention. Uh, and they're saying how, you know, you select a number of these uh, control uh, group time series. And based on all of these control group time series, you estimate and forecast the evolution of the one you care about. So they're doing this. There's an example in, uh, in their presentation and in their paper. Um, let me come back to that. There's an example in their presentation um, about um, implementing, so Google cares about ads, right? About selling ads and making money. That's how they make money. So the example they give is of this um, ad campaign, like estimating the causal effect of this ad campaign. Um, and here they're saying um, they are, um, so th their uh, time series of interest is clicks to some on, on some websites to some ad, clicks on some ad, right, over time. And you know, they've changed something in the design of that ad or whatever, okay? Then they're tracking the number of clicks uh, on that ad over time. Um, and they want to reason about the effect of this particular intervention, which was the, um, I don't know, this uh, redesign of the ad or something like that. Okay, so um, here's a cool, um, a cool idea. So for example, um, they could have only done this um, redesign in some um, country, but not in others. Or they could have only done this redesign on some subset of users, but not all users. Or, you know, things like that. Think, think of ways in which you can um, find control groups um, that are uh, applicable here. So for example, if I only change the color or the font size or something of this ad that people in the US see based on their IP addresses or something, okay? But I don't change the color of the same ad that people in Europe see, for example, okay? The time series of clicks on this ad from people in Europe acts as a control group, right? Because nothing changed for them. Okay, and you know, I, I could come up with a number of these, um, right? And so notice, notice the important bit here. Notice how um, noisy and sort of fluctuating these time series are and how subject to all kinds of 
seasonal effects and uh, things like that, right? So notice how uh, essentially, if you just look at, so coming back to the criticism about the diff and diff, if you just look at two observations, two points in time before and after the intervention, like what if you get unlucky? Like what if you measure the before intervention point at the bottom of that, uh, you know, in, in one of those dips in the time series, and you measure the after the intervention point at the top of the uh, the time series, or something at the peak of the time series, right? So notice how you know you could be very um, sensitive to, to when you're measuring this, uh, and that's is potentially problematic with uh, real noisy data that fluctuates a lot like this over time. So what they're saying is, you know, let's take all of these uh, control group time series. Um, let me go back here. Let's take all of this. So let's say the green and the red ones are the uh, clicks in, in Europe or something. Um, and the black one is the one you're observing in the US. Um, let's take all of these control group time series and throw them into a model together with um, the, the one I'm observing, uh, the one of interest. And let's use that model to forecast how the black series would have evolved after the intervention. Okay. Uh, and you know they they do this a number of times, and they do this. Uh, the little uh, blue um, shaded areas you see there in the plot are the confidence intervals. So you could see, for example, how the farther ahead in time you are looking to forecast, the less confident you are on average, which is sort of expected, right? Because you know it's the, the more into the future you're trying to predict, the uh, larger your margin of error is likely to be, and so on. But notice how you can get some estimate, some forecast of what your time series of interest would have looked like, uh, looked like had it not been for this intervention, right? So given this, the exact same reasoning that we used before for the other things um, comes in. And uh, the difference between what you're actually observing, the black line, and what you forecasted you would have observed had it not been for that intervention, but right. that difference is essentially uh, not as, is the estimate of your causal effect. Um, and this is um, nicer than the diff and diff because it takes into account all of this fluctuation over time and you you can account for seasonal effects and all kinds of other things uh, and so on. Does that make sense? So question to you, how do you know if you have good control group, uh, a good control group? We can test whether the, uh, the pre-period outcome variables and their trend are similar with that of the control group. But what if it's spurious? What if they're so spuriously correlated? Like um, we, we talked about this many lectures ago about spurious correlations. I don't know, the number of films that Nicolas Cage starred in and something else that was very perfectly correlated. Be creative, a trick, something. How about this? What if, what if we consider a fake intervention? What if we take any arbitrary point in time 
before before the actual intervention in the pre-period, any arbitrary point in time, what if we take that to be some fake intervention? But is that the same thing um, as finding the control group that have the same trend as the treatment group before? But it's a way of testing that, right? It's a way yeah. of testing that the correlation is not spurious. I mean, even if we consider fake treatment and test, there is no effect at that fake fake treatment uh, fake treatment time. Uh, it's still possible that there is a spurious correlation. Because you're saying the control time series matches perfectly the treated one for other reasons than the treatment. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose you're right. So I suppose that's not gonna be enough. Yeah, so I guess the only other thing you can do and I admit this is not very satisfying. The only other thing you can do is maybe two things. A, use your domain expertise to reason about those effects or lack thereof in the, or, or association or appropriateness of the control group. Um, and B, use a bunch, use not just one control group, so one control time series to um, forecast the future of yours post intervention, but several. Um, and actually, if you go to the, the talk I, I mentioned, I think the author talks about using something like maybe a dozen or so control time series, um, if you can identify that many all together um, when forecasting the evolution of the one you care about. So probably this combination of domain knowledge plus um, reducing the chances that you're, you're using a spuriously correlated time series by using multiple time series that you um, expect will all have some value as, as controls, um, you sort of reduce the risk of um, just hitting a spurious one. So, I, I, okay, so back to my original question, I guess the answer is, is you use multiple so that it's less likely that, even if you have spurious ones in there, um, let's say despite your domain expertise, domain knowledge, it's less likely that all of them are spurious, right? If you have multiple. So you should still get a good counterfactual estimate from all the ones that are not spurious, even if there's some noise in there. Hmm. The the other cool thing about this, um, and um, you could check this out yourselves, um, there's an R package that does all of this stuff uh, automatically for you. Apparently it's very easy to use. Um, just a few API calls, you plug in your data and a couple of lines of R code, and you get all of these estimates of uh, counterfactuals and effect sizes. Um, so that seems pretty promising. Okay, so that's more or less what I um, had in mind for today. So two examples of causal inference techniques that use observational data. Of course, if you can run true experiments, then by all means run true experiments. That's more, you're more confident in a causal claim if you're 
um, running a true experiment, but there's lots of reasons why you can't run true experiments. So the next best thing you could do is use appropriate causal inference statistical analysis techniques that work with observational data. Uh, and I've shown you three. I've shown you this interrupted time series design last time, and I've shown you two today. I've shown you this diff and diff and the causal impact thing from Google. Um, all of these three are um, powerful and they're very commonly used um, in, in science. Um, this thing from Google is newer, so I, I think it made uh, so historically, it hasn't been as popular, uh, but it seems very powerful and it seems to subsume some of the other ones that we talked about. So it's, uh, I expect we'll see more of this uh, going forward. Uh, but that, that's sort of what I had in mind. So I'm happy to take some questions or finish early or whatever you'd like to do. Oh, I have important vaccine gossip, actually. <laughs> uh, the governor bumped back the eligibility for everyone over 16 in PA to today. So everyone is eligible. If you know anybody in PA who needs it, who is waiting, you can get it today. Cool. So if you're looking for a vaccine, then take the remaining time uh, from this class that you got, just got back and go schedule yourself an appointment. I don't know how that didn't come up at the start. <laughs> Just that's great news. Thank you for that. So I guess the um, we follow up to find a time to talk for ten minutes about your research projects sometime this week. Just to see if you're doing okay. I see yes from Hannah. Okay, so that's it. Um, no class on Thursday. I see you on Tuesday again. Please let me know if you want to see certain topics in the remainder of the semester. Okay. So I can plan for that. All right, thanks.